Welcome to the Diet Doc Movement podcast for episode two of our three-part series on disordered eating. We have invited one of our favorite people and the Diet Doc's vice president and health psychologist, Dr. Corey Probst, into these conversations. She eloquently broached the topics of anorexia and bulimia in our first episode. Today, she explores a very prevalent eating behavior, yet not often talked about, binge eating disorder. Hi, everybody. It's Alexa and Meredith again with the Diet Doc Movement with one of our absolutely favorite people in the world, Dr. Corey Probst, for part two of our eating disorder podcast. So, Corey, thanks for being here again. Welcome. Thank you. The last time we chatted on the seriousness of anorexia and bulimia and Today, I'd love to dive into another arena or another facet of disordered eating of um, a binge eating disorder. Can you first just define what that is and, and we'll go from there? Yeah, binge eating disorder is actually one of the most common eating disorders. It's three times more common than all the others combined. Um, and it affects people of all body shapes, sizes. It, it really does not discriminate socioeconomic status, age, race, ethnicity, gender identity, doesn't. Um, to be diagnosed with binge eating disorder, you need to meet a certain criteria and that's a binge episode at least one time per week for three months. And I will say that with individuals whom I've worked with, um, Oftentimes the binges occur a lot more often than that, at least a few times, a few times per week. Um, now with binge eating disorder, and I'm going to put this in the context of bulimia versus binge eating disorder, so we can kind of clarify the difference. With bulimia, there is there's compensatory actions taken post binge. That means that the individual because there is a fear of fat and a fear of weight gain and significant preoccupation with body weight and size with bulimia. Um, that means that they're purging or throwing up afterwards. It means that they may be taking laxatives to get rid of the food. Um, it may mean that they're engaging in uh, significant exercise afterwards to try to burn the calories that they just consumed. With binge eating disorder, that's not necessarily the case. That's not part of the diagnostic criteria to be diagnosed. Um, what I will, what I'll say, however, though, is I do. There, what happens after the binge um, is there. There is still a significant amount of guilt, a significant amount of shame, and and fear about w what is happening, why they did it, why can't. They control their behavior um, and shame around just having these urges and the binges are typically occurring in secrecy. Um, you know, they're not occurring in front of other people. Uh, loved ones might find like wrappers and food packaging um, shoved in different places and, and hidden uh, individuals with binge eating disorder. Well, they'll often hoard food. Um, so those are, those are some of the ways in which we can tell the differences, but it's mainly that there, there aren't necessarily compensatory, compensatory measures, um, that are taken, but there's a significant amount of psychological guilt and shame that occurs. So and I'll, I'll say this too, um, Meredith, that what I have seen a lot in my work is that binge eating disorder will often start due to significant food restriction. And all of us who work in an industry where we're helping individuals lose body fat and, you know, attain um, a significant physique uh, based upon what, what they believe their ideal is, um, it, it's, 
it's not difficult to find individuals who have been dieting for significant periods of times, possibly um, for most of their lives. And the clients that I've worked with with binge eating disorder, you know, they've, they've been involved in dieting since they were like less than five years old. It started then. They watched their caregivers diet. Um, they were indoctrinated into a culture of dieting and food restriction and food obsession and always talking about bodies and being lighter and being leaner. And they developed this significant phobia to fat. And that doesn't mean that they, again, it can happen with anyone um, in any body. Um, fear of fat, uh, you know, if you have an individual in a larger body, it can be fear of getting fatter or having more fat. And if you have an individual in a smaller body, it can be fear of gaining it. Um, and so it, you know, again, it doesn't, eating disorders don't discriminate. Um, and so for individuals with binge eating disorder, we can't necessarily assume that it's a, it's food restriction that causes it. However, um, it, happens a lot. Um, and oftentimes the binge is caused by an episode of restriction. And so when we're talking about helping a person heal from it, um, first and foremost, we need to remedy, uh, remedy the restriction piece because physiologically, if, if we continue to do that, you know, the body is very smart. <laughs> The body is going to take care of us. Um, the body knows much more what we need than our mind does oftentimes. Uh, so it's really wrapping our, wrapping all of our tentacles tenderly and gently around all of these different facets and getting a sense for what is driving this person towards food in the first place. And it could be physiological, not getting enough nourishment it could be psychological. This person doesn't necessarily have the, the ability or the capacity or the emotional intelligence skills to be with significant, intense emotion. And those occur in the body. Um, but the other thing that I will say is that oftentimes a binge, um, or even with someone with bulimia, again, it's like we're cross-pollinating here a lot of times. Um, you don't necessarily have to be hungry. And a lot of times with the clients that I've worked with, they're not hungry when the binge occurs. So. It's clear the psychological component of, yeah. especially with binge eating. Very much. Can, can you touch base on the physiological effects of binge eating? I know that's kind of a broad spectrum since it can happen to anybody yeah. regardless their health or their size or their age, but are there any ramifications from this type of distorted eating? Yeah, there really are because when we consume a significant amount of food in a very short period of time um, and or whether, whether or not there are compensatory measures taken, whether it's throwing up and purging or laxative use or over-exercise, I mean, we are really disrupting the body's regulatory mechanisms with electrolytes in particular. Um, oftentimes, you know, and again, this really varies. And so we want to be uh, cognizant and we want to be careful about how we move into um, assessing an individual because we should never make any assumptions about um, what's causing it, how it's done, what the binge um, it includes, <laughs> um, because I've, I've seen it run the gamut. Um, mostly binges are not on, uh, they're not on non-processed foods. Usually binges are, um, they're incorporating foods that the person may not eat normally but in very, very large amounts and, and packaged foods and processed foods. And I don't want this for, I don't want this to sound like I'm demonizing those types of foods because I'm not at all just kind of differentiating that people can have different ways of, of binging and the, the different foods they binge on. Um, 
I've also seen individuals who are aiming for specific physique and body fat levels who are overly, they're getting overly hungry and then the body just snaps and says, we are eating. Um, they're binging on baked chicken and they're binging on a copious amount of vegetables and different things. And, you know, we know just from, just from our work as nutrition consultants, if you're consuming that much fiber at one time, cause you're, you're, you're just, you're eating a ton of fibrous carbs and vegetables. I mean, you can have significant GI distress. Um, so physiologically, uh, I mean, a lot of things happen, but the body, the body is forced to regulate with a lot of things when it's consuming that much food at one time. And, you know, individuals will describe it as like not being able to move, like their heart rate feels like it's beating out of their chest. Um, you know, they're just so full. A lot of times they become so full that they just throw up automatically because their body can't hold that food down. Um, so it's, it's incredibly physically uncomfortable. Um, but then psychologically too, you know, there's just significant shame around why did I do this? Why can't I stop it? How come I can't control this? What's wrong with me? Um, it's very, very, again, the critical voice pops in. And usually what will happen is, well, I did this. And so now I need to not eat the next day. Now I need to restrict. Um, what can I do to make up for this? And, you know, that just, it sets you up for the next binge. But in the moment, it's very much, I have to clean this up somehow. Um, and this is the way that, that I, I best know how. And so it really is teaching um, about teaching individuals how to well, avoid the, the binge in the first place. Um, but then if we do have a binge, how do we respond to ourselves? Mm -hmm. Alexa and I touch base with clients um, that may be struggling with this and we, we lay it out there. We say this binge restrict cycle. It's a very cyclical pattern. As you said, it's at least once per week for three months. And I think the fact that we use those terms just so, I don't want to say bluntly, it brings light to how common this is. And I think it kind of softens the, the fear of admission of this might be what's happening and keeping our clients from a certain goal attainment. And I, I don't know if Lex can jump in and attest to this, but I've found that the fact that we can comfortably talk about it and that it unfortunately is a, a common practice that it softens the fear of, oh, there, there must be something wrong with me. It's lack of willpower. It's, it's, you know, lack of motivation to get to my goals. And no, this is something that can be prevented based on the actions we're taking to avoid getting to that, as opposed to it's happened, let's fix it. It's let's, let's look at the patterns. Lex, can you jump in on, can you recall like any specific scenarios or, or how that broach of the topic is really powerful with our clients? Yeah, I think, um, especially when we first started out, we didn't really talk about it a lot. And to be honest, I didn't think it was as popular as it is either. I didn't know that many people struggled with it. Um, so like Meredith said, I think just right out of the gate explaining that it is common, it, it, it does happen and how can we prevent it from happening and, and, you know, just teaching our clients about it, I think does soften that blow a little bit of like, oh, okay, so I don't have to hide it. I don't have to lie. I don't have to pretend that I just wasn't hungry that day when really in my head I was just restricting. And um, so I think just, yeah, just starting right off the bat, just explaining like, hey, this is a lot of people deal with this and a way, way more than what I thought. Um, and I can even give an example too. And it, again, it's kind of, you know, uh, we're talking a little about disordered eating in here too, but uh, you know, back in my competitor days, you know, I, I definitely had different scenarios where I was binge eating and it wasn't for me, it wasn't even on, you know, necessarily on purpose. I know it sounds crazy, but it was, 
you're dieting down to get on stage and you're so restricted, so restricted. I remember, I remember after I got on stage, I had a lady that made me this chocolate treat and I literally just had one after the other, after after the other, after the other. I couldn't, I could not stop. And, you know, looking back at it now, like at the time I thought that that was okay, that that was normal, you know, and now looking back, I'm like, that is so not normal. (laughs) I mean, that is not, that's not okay. Um, so yeah, it's, I, mean, I, like, like, I can't nod big enough. <laughs> Alexa, like I'm, I am, rem- I'm remembering my competitive days too. And th- you know, that behavior was reinforced. Mm-hmm. I remember the conversations backstage with the other women about all the things they were going to eat once the show was over they were planning the binge and that was, that was accepted. That's just what you did because you restricted so much to get on stage in the first place. Like, and you knew you were starving. You could say that like, I'm starving. I'm hungry all the time. And then when you got off stage, like that was just what you did. And I think the same thing happens within the dieting industry when we say, hey, once a week, why don't you go have a cheat day? We're, all, we're setting someone up for a binge disorder yeah. by advocating for that sort of behavior. No, you know what? How about we're eating adequate amounts of food throughout the week so that you don't feel compelled and obsessive and getting to the point physiologically where you're not going to be able to stop eating food because you're not getting enough. It's crazy too what it does. Your mind just just takes over. Um, I I was talking to Meredith about this before, but I I am not a big fan of cake in general. Just don't really like it. <laughs> my favorite dessert. <laughs> really? yeah. I remember I when cake, I like not super moist cake, but yes, super cake. moist cake. But I remember when I was competing, I was craving it so bad. And it's like all I could think about. And in my head, I'm like, I know this is not normal. Mm-hmm. I don't even like it. Well, how am I craving something I don't even like? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's just your body is just wow. telling you, you need, you're hungry, you need, you need. But it's just, body is saying, it just can just, just morph your whole, your whole mind. Absolutely. And that is something that's an indicator. Like that's a cue for those of you who are watching If you are thinking about food all the time, that's a problem. That's a problem in an obsessive sort of clingy, grabby, oh my gosh, like when when is my next meal sort of a way? That's a problem. (laughs) That needs, something needs changing with your plan if that's occurring. Mm -hmm. And I think that so easily we can go from that disordered eating of like fixation around food and I'm on a diet. So I should be thinking about my nutritional choices and how quickly, and we've seen it turn the other way and go straight to that clinical eating disorder. And I think if we can kind of not crush diet culture, but like teach people that diet culture and diet are different in a conversation that we, the three of us have had before, but if we can teach people that take the practices now, while you are say dieting towards a different body composition from a different approach to avoid ever having to completely steer into then a, a clinical medical, you know, inpatient problem at hand. And I think this sets us up for our next topic of just disordered eating. And this will be a long one. So (laughs) it probably will be a long one. (laughs) It will. So are there anything else? Yeah. Meredith, what you just said kind of sparked a thought, which was that I, I love that. I just want to comment on what you said before that the two of you, you're very authentic and you start the conversation with your clients very openly. Um, I think it's very important to say, look, here are the risks associated with really restrictive dieting. This is what we've seen. 
we have experience potentially with these issues and these are what we want to avoid. Here are the signs and symptoms. We want you guys to be honest about what you're experiencing. What are the thoughts that are popping up in your mind? How are you feeling physiologically? Let's start measuring hunger levels in between meals because you know, part of this process is getting to know your body and getting your body's needs met and developing the relationship with your body that's that's trusting and compassionate. And it's it's a two-way sort of a street where you listen to it, it listens to you, and you're able to kind of be in a dynamic conversation with your body. Um, but I'll say this, that if we're not as individuals learning how to be with our emotion and understanding what emotion is and understanding our triggers for intense emotion and our cues and um, really learning, really learning about ourselves from a self-awareness perspective, there may be, and we, and we might have these tendencies towards control around food, either very rigid control like anorexia or like chaotic control with bulimia and binge eating disorder. They're like on opposite ends of the continuum, if you can look at it like that way. Um, if, we, if we're not aware of our tendencies, um, we may be facing difficult situations or circumstances or transitions in our lives, um, a breakup, a move across the country, a new job, having a baby, getting pregnant, losing a baby, losses, things. And there's a reason why we saw a huge uptick in eating disorders when COVID happened, right? Huge transition, so many unknowns, lack of connection. <laughs> that is why um, self-awareness is so, so important and learning how to be with our emotion because we will, when the shit hits the fan, pardon my language, but when it does, those are the times we are most at risk if we have tendencies like this to move towards obsessive compulsive behaviors around food. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think our clients are, whether they're smiling or just reflecting, I think that that answers a lot of maybe the questions that they had in regard to the questions we've had for them. Mm -hmm. So I, I really hope that this segment of the eating disorder podcast that we're recording here with Corey resonates and helps strengthen the relationship that you have with your own diet and yourself. And I think our next episode is going to resonate with so many more people too. So Corey, again, we thank you for your knowledge, your time, your expertise, whether you want to admit it or not, you definitely are an expert on the topic. And we thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you both. I love you guys. Thank you, Corey. You bet. Bye. Mm -hmm. If you or someone you know is battling an eating disorder, please don't hesitate to contact the National Eating Disorders Association through text, call, or chat feature at nationaleatingdisorders.org.